Welcome to Halftime. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm a Halftime alumni from Greenville, South Carolina in the USA. And this is our 46th live streaming event. And I want you to know how much we appreciate you joining us. Now, Halftime is the world's leading peer learning center for successful people who are in transition. We teach, coach, and connect leaders who are looking for more meaning, joy, and impact in their next season. Now, please vote in today's polls, and this will help prioritize Jimmy's discussion and shape future programming also. Just to let you know, we have one seat each coming up in trainings in Raleigh and Charlotte, North Carolina, as well as an online event with the Halftime Refresh. Now, if you want to get more information, you can click on the green box below. That'll provide Lloyd's email address. You can email him for more information and see if you have the opportunity to join one of those groups. Now, I thank you so much for joining today's event, which is Communicating Your Life Purpose. Let's bring everybody up on screen here. Uh, we have fellow Halftime alumni, Jimmy Seibert, and he's going to share his thoughts on crafting how you share your life purpose. So once you've gone through the effort to become clear on your life purpose, and the context best live it out, how's the best way to share this with important stakeholders in your life? After all, some, if not all of them, will have different reactions to your newfound life purpose. And how we communicate this is important because despite our best intentions, some can be missed opportunities and then others can, be, can create long-lasting damage. Now, in this 30-minute event, we're going to learn how to shape our elevator speech in both a winsome and a way that's consistent with our worldview. Now, over the past 30 years, Jimmy and Laura Seibert have expanded from a small gathering into an international movement of churches that train and send men and women around the world, spreading the life-saving message of Jesus. Jimmy authored Passion and Purpose, Believing the Church Can Still Change the World. Now, this tells their story and seeks to inspire others to live with a passion for Jesus and his purposes here on earth. Now, with his wife, Laura, they wrote a really helpful book, Parenting Without Regret, Raising Kids with a Purpose, Not Perfection. Welcome, Jimmy and Lloyd. Hey, welcome. Thank you. So thanks, Doug. You know, this is a big topic. And Jimmy, I, I'm just so grateful that you're um, willing to share some of your wisdom learned over so many years on this. And as you and I get clear on our purpose and our calling, you know, it's such an important part of making the impact that we most long to make in the ensuing years. But doing it well requires wisdom. And it can be a huge inspiration to a lot of people or can bring out the most contentious side in some of the people right around us and even the audience that we're trying to serve. And I've made some mistakes in this, as I shared with you, uh, Jimmy. You know, first of all, I think in my immediate circle of friends and brothers, I sometimes came across as if, you know, just the idea of being a successful real estate developer or, you know, a, a management consultant like my brother was, uh, was somehow less than pursuing some, you know, calling that was more aligned with, quote, nonprofit or ministry. And that was unintended, but the consequences were that I didn't really have the full opportunity to inspire those right around me. Instead, they kind of distanced themselves from the conversation. I remember being in one of our retirement communities one day talking to a wonderful lady who is a retired professor from University of Toronto. And I explained a project I was working on in Albania that was a development relief project with a mission agency. And she looked at me after I explained it and she said, you know, that's one of the most pejorative and colonial things I've heard in a long time. And that was a bit of an eye opener for me. It was, it was a bit stunning. And I realized that, gosh, I just wasn't sensitive to where she was coming from in order to frame it in a way that she would better understand it and, and without changing my own worldview. Now, you know, at the Halftime Institute, we have learned over the last 25 years to help people shape their elevator speech. We do it by and large by taking them through a scripted process of um, 
you know, first of all, start by explaining to people that you're sharing your calling with um, what you did in your career, what your career has been, what made you successful perhaps in that career, what brought you to inflection point or renewal point where you were looking for something different or something more with more meaning, joy or impact. And what was that journey like for you? What were some of the hurdles you, you had to overcome? And then lastly, what have you landed on? And what are you doing and why does it bring so much meaning and joy into your life? Maybe share a story. And so that's the way we've done it so far. However, Jimmy, you have learned over the years that even if you do a great job at that, you can still encounter uh, challenges with people who either question your motives or they don't agree with your work or your worldview, which is more common in our contentious culture, or they really don't understand why on earth you would give your life to service. And why would, in my case, a real estate developer give some of that up at the very peak earning years in order to pursue something else that that they didn't quite understand um, the motivation behind it? So we want to learn from you. And first of all, tell us a little bit about what you and, and your fa- friends have been doing in building the Antioch movement around the world these last 30 years. Well, thanks, Lloyd. It's just such an honor to be with you guys. And um, yeah, just for a little context, uh, Laura and I both went to Baylor University and I worked in business when I first got out of school. And we really I wanted to answer this prayer, God, how do our lives most impact the world? What could, what, what could we do? What does that look like? And in a very kind of sovereign thing, God spoke to our hearts to sell everything and move into the inner city and begin to learn what it meant to live cross-culturally and make disciples. And what we say, both coming from the suburbs, our first neighbor across the street, there were two uh, single African-American women in between them. They had 16 children. So we learned children's ministry. We learned how to cook in chaos. Uh, We learned how to love another culture. And they were a delight and became sweet, dear friends, as many as our other neighbors did as well. But then we also got together a group of young people. We said, hey, let's start a little volunteer missions training school where we'll spend nine months in the city and three months overseas trying to answer these basic questions. What if, as a believer, what if we really prayed? And we taught them how to really pray personally and corporately. What if we really shared the gospel, not just talked about it or took people to church, but what if we found out how to share the gospel in a way that people could have an opportunity to come to Jesus through our own life and witness. We said, what if we made disciples? And by discipleship, we said, you invested in people who were investing in others who were investing in others. Um, What if we learned how to serve instead of be served? What would that look like to do justice and do good in our city? And what if we did it together as a community? Well, we had uh, eight students in that first year and we said, you know what? I bet if we actually did all these things, we could change the world. And out of that journey, eventually after the uh, five years or so, we began to lead a young adult and a college ministry that grew to several hundred people. And then we began to plant churches because we said, where is the gospel not? If, if we believe the gospel's the answer to every world problem, where is it not? And we found ourselves in Southern Siberia. That's where people from Waco, Texas start planting churches. Uh, <laughs> Southern <laughs> Siberia is where we started and a unique partnership uh, in the early 90s. And we saw God move powerfully, and those churches are still there today, still flourishing, still, still dear Russian friends um, in Siberia. But out of that, we just took up this basic context concept of saying, what if we made disciples that made disciples and did that through the church? And by 1999, we planted our own church called Antioch Community Church, And we planted ourselves in the inner city because we said, look, we want to reach the poor around the world. At that time, we were working in Afghanistan, Pakistan, all kinds of crazy places throughout the Middle East. And we said, if we're going to learn how to reach them there, we have to learn how to live it out here. So if there's a theme I want you to hear throughout the uh, conversation is this, is that people are desperate for authenticity. Um, They don't want to know. It's not. We always talk about ministering to the poor or ministering cross-culturally. It's not ministering to them. It's ministering with them side by side. So we moved our family and we moved into the inner city, even though we were a regional church and we had people from the suburbs and people from the city. And by um, 2020 or so, we were the largest church in our city, a multicultural church. And doing a lot of the things that we had set out to do. And that was, hey, how do we um, 
um, do justice in a righteous way. If there's uh, needs in our schools, then all right, we're, we created a whole mentoring program. If there were drug addicts on the street, then we created uh, rehab houses. And if um, the gospel wasn't preached in a certain community, let's do it. So out of all that, we said that uh, if we'll live that uh, here, then we'll plant churches in the U.S. And we'll plant churches around the world. So that's kind of been our theme. That's been our uh, our um, journey. And um, as you said, uniquely, I think we all faced 2020, and some of those challenges begin to show up like we never could have even believed. Well, yeah, you know, you and I have been on this halftime journey together for the last two or three years, and even after so many years of really sort of sleeping on the floor for the cause of the most, the biggest human needs in Waco, Texas and around the world and, and really going through life colorblind and loving extravagantly, uh, the, whoever you lock eyes with, um, you have still encountered maybe the most, the biggest testing time mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. And as I heard you going through that and watched you know, you processing it in, in a humble way. And I thought, gosh, not only am I learning from that, but I think we, all of our halftime alumni can learn. You know, you came through halftime to really think through how to make the next 30 years even more um, productive to, to be the soil that produces a hundredfold in the ensuing 30 years. And yet this was a big challenge for you. So, you know, th this is a culture that's gotten more contentious. And I have a few questions around that. What does that mean to you, Jimmy? Mm -hmm. Why is it true? And how do you now approach sharing your vision and purpose given this new context? Yeah. So one of the things that we, um, you know, learn through the years by working around the world is that we always underestimate culture. And what that means is when you go into a new culture, you have to learn the language, the heart language. You have to understand their worldview. You got to understand kind of how they see things. And without understanding the culture, you end up making uh, presuppositions and then um, uh, communicating in a way that is not uh, meeting the need of their heart or um, bringing them into what God has for them. And I think that all of us were shocked after the 2016 elections at one level at the amount of tension that had been present and the amount of um, shaping the culture had done in people's kind of worldview and understanding of even the place of politics, putting our hope far beyond uh, where it should even have been placed. And so I think that uh, uh, as we look back, uh, I had a friend that uh, led our college or led our all young adults, and he said something happened about five years ago that they're going to write about for years to come, and I haven't identified it yet, but something's changed. And what I would simply say is this: we moved from a Christian culture base to a full humanistic base, or humanism became the predominant theme. So what began to happen is words began to be hijacked that were the churches or was the ministry. So words like justice, what does justice mean? Man, justice means to love compassionately your neighbor as yourself. But for us as believers, also as a part of that, to share the gospel, to, to save the inner man and the outer man. And, and, um, and we were doing acts of justice, but somebody changed the dials on what that word meant or what it should say. And so we became, instead of the the heroes who were doing so many good things, we became the accused that didn't uh, that didn't relate. And so th that's just a little example. So, you know, you heard the you've heard the script that we use to help half timers share their story in a powerful way. Go back to who you were to set the context yep. and what what was the burning you know this smoldering discontent in your heart that made you want to go through a renewal season and what was the inflection point and how did you yep. make your way through it? What are you doing now and how is it bringing meaning and joy to you? What's your advice to to our, all our alumni around the world now as they really try to shape shape their message and their worldview in a simple, maybe an elevator speech, you may only get a minute or two to share it with somebody, or you may have 20 minutes, or you may be speaking in a corporate context where you have, you know, you're doing a 45 minute um, keynote talk. What's your advice to them on how they shape that without really wavering on mm -hmm. our own worldview? And let me tell you a little story to maybe 
bring that in that I learned years ago. Um, in 2001, we had two of our missionaries from Afghanistan in prison, and it became a big national issue. Some of you guys may remember two young ladies, Heather Mercer and Dana Curry. And when they were in prison, we were doing weekly press conferences and uh, all the biggest news agencies would come from the AP to the BBC to Fox or CNN, et cetera. And um, they, they would uh, come and often do little uh, programs about us while the girls were in prison. And the CNN crew showed up one weekend. And as we prayed about how do we address the CNN crew? I mean, you know, we are Christians. We have missionaries in the Muslim world. How are we going to deal with this? And as we prayed about it, we said, well, look, do we have anything to hide? Is there anything inauthentic about us? Is there anything that's not true that we're ashamed of or we hope they don't find out? And so we we took the approach, let's just be 100% authentic. And whether it uh, meets their need or not, if we're genuine and we're truly Christ followers, truly compassionate, truly loving, truly looking at their interests, who knows what God might do. But if they want to persecute us, they're going to persecute us. But let's be true to ourselves. Let's be authentic. So anyway, the first morning, the CNN crew's in the back, and we go through the service, and we just have a normal service. We're not trying to do anything. And the guy afterwards, I met with the crew, and they said, what was that presence? And I said, what are you talking about? They said, there was a presence in the room. What was it? And I said, well, well, that was God, and, and uh, he cares about you, man. He does. He's brought you here because he cares about you. Well, over the next three days, I just took the main reporter, the lead guy. I would take him to take my kids to school. We had him over for dinner. We let him just interact with our people from our maintenance people to friends that we had throughout the city. We just lived life together. So at the end of the third day, this well-known CNN reporter says to me, he said, hey, man, do you mind me asking you a question? Uh, he said, I, 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 he said, it's bugged me. So I want to, I want to ask you, he said, I, I like you. I, I want to ask you a real question. I said, great. He said, why do you Christians think that we're always after you? And I said, cause you are, you know, I said, you know, best I can see, you know, we have different worldviews. You don't like our worldview, et cetera. So he, we, we talked and actually laughed a little bit about it. And he said, I don't think you understand. He said, remember, we are trained to see duplicity and to find out where it is. He said, Christians too many times are trying to be coy with us and trying to think they're going to win at the game. Remember, it's our game to find duplicity. Don't play games with us. When people play games, we want to find out what's actually true. He said, but you, I like you. He said, I don't agree with everything you do and how you live your life, everything. He said, but I like you because I can tell you like me. And I like what you're doing. I like what you're about. At least I know who you are. I don't think you're hiding anything from me. Well, they would go on to do a story called People in the News at that time. And it was very um, encouraging of all things. CNN did a really an encouraging deal, captured our hearts, etc. It doesn't always turn out that way. But here's the big deal. Is it authentic? Are you trying to communicate to, be, to get the market? Or are you communicating from your heart? So that even when it's difficult, we're at least going to be authentic in the way that we communicate our message. So that doesn't answer your question, Lloyd, which you can ask me one off of that. I'll, I'm happy to hone that down to our elevator speech. But again, what I would say is remember, people experience who you are more than what you think. You know, uh, I would say this in First John, what we felt, what we tasted, what we touched, that's what we communicate to you. And when people hear us talk about our life purpose, when people hear us talk about our mission in life, whatever it might be in the workplace or in the nonprofit world, they want to what, what they will experience is what you really believe. And so um, just wanted to make note of that as we go a little deeper. And, you know, Jimmy, that, that makes that story reminds me of, you know, way back uh, the lady that kind of uh, in my retirement home who who felt like my comments and my ideology was colonial. Um, when I came back from Albania that winter, um, I shared with her pictures and stories of families that we had helped and loved. And they were in a season where they were trying to learn market driven farming. They'd been told what to to grow and by the communist government there for 73 years and, and the children that we had loved and the things we had brought them. And, uh, and, and, and she got to see more than you know, what, what the heart was behind it. And so sometimes I think this comes down to eye contact and, 
tone of voice and um, and smiling and and stories. The power of telling stories as opposed to just blurting out ideas is is an important part. Well, Doug, um, I think you're going to tee up tee up a um, a poll maybe for us. Absolutely. So, Jimmy, we'd like to get your thoughts on the response to the poll. So, which situation below creates the most angst when sharing your life purpose? Our first answer is indifference, when others just don't seem to care. The second answer is confusion, when people can't grasp the importance of my passion, especially when compared to my previous career path. Defensiveness. I apparently pricked a nerve, and they become defensive. Open criticism, intentionally and openly criticizing my motives. And the bottom one is none of the above. So our audience is pretty solidly in the indifference category, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. They're saying when others just don't seem to care. And the second one is confusion, when people can't grasp the importance of of my passion, especially compared to my previous career path. So what do you think? Uh, I, I think I told you before we got on, I thought indifference should win, and it did. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> you know, people um, are, self-interest drives everyone. And until you're able to bring them into um, your story, until you're able to for them to feel, taste, and touch it, I think you should expect indifference. Um, So that's why I often uh, ask questions first before I try to share my elevator speech. Try to get a gauge of who they are, where they're coming from, what is it that uh, that they need. Uh, Actually, one of the funny things I often say is that uh, I can sit on a plane next to somebody and literally talk to them for two hours asking them questions and they will never ask me a question uh, because people are so into their world. But if I ask enough questions, I'll find out their life purpose. And by finding out their life purpose, I will find a way to interject my own. So my, I might just say if we experience indifference or confusion of what we're trying to say, you might find out what their worldview is first. Once you understand that, find a way to apply your story to theirs. And, you know, this topic doesn't just apply to sort of strangers, but, you know, if you have kids like Linda and I do, they get married and you're welcoming new family members into your family and they don't know the whole backstory. And so, you know, in, in my case, they may be not going to take the time to read the books I've written or go and, <laughs> you know, listen to talks and stuff like that. Right, Jim, your kids probably have read the, the your books, yeah. but maybe <laughs> it, your son-in-law or daughter-in-law may not have. And so, I mean, I have to kind of gently come alongside them and share the stories of um, one of the things Bob taught me to do was to keep a book of days, an artifact every day of where I see God at work in someone's life through me. It's not a book of look at Lloyd go. It's a book of look at God go. And um, that's one way as I share that with the kids and I remind them, you know, you could take a black marker and cross off my name on every single page. It wouldn't change a thing. But look at what God chose to do in someone's life just yesterday or the day before. And I got a note this morning. I went in to Linda from somebody that uh, came to a talk I did 12 years ago. And I shared it with her just as a way of encouraging her. Because what we want to try to do is bring the the stakeholders of our life along with us so that they can help us stay in the game. This is about finishing well. It's not only about influencing others. It's about needing your tribe to be on the journey with you. Well, um, can I share something about that? Lord? Yeah. yeah so um, uh, my, our daughter was married and our other daughter was engaged and we have uh, two sons who were single at the time and we were, um, having everybody for Christmas. And Laura, Laura and I got the great idea of, hey, let's do a family mission statement, just like we did and we raised our kids with. Now that we have son-in-laws, let's do an extended family mission statement. So it sounded like a great idea to us. Then my son, my uh, uh, new son-in-law, or about to be the engaged one, he raised his hand. He said, hey, could I get something right here? Aren't Lauren and I supposed to get our mission statement and like, run our own family? So basically, what did I just step into here? And uh and I said, well, hey, here's how it goes. I said uh, to Brady, I said, Brady, you're responsible for before God for your marriage. 
Everybody in this room is going to support you, love you, and be a champion for you, but you're responsible before God. When you have kids, you'll be responsible for your kids before the Lord. Now, we'll help you. We're here to support you and everything else. And I said, but but don't get me wrong. We're not looking to raise you to be independent. We're looking to raise people to be interdependent. We're not asking for codependence. We're not asking for independence. We're asking for interdependence. So we talk about pulling our family into our story or our next part of life. We're, what we're saying is, hey, guys, there is, we need you. Just as you needed us, we need you. And can we, in an interdependent way, take the strength of our family and um, support one another in the journey? And so that was a kind of defining moment. What are we shooting for? Is it codependence or independence? It's interdependence. And when we pull, pull in our family with that mindset, I find that they buy in more because, yeah, they now want to turn and support us if they know what the playing field looks like. Yeah, and that's such a joy, Jimmy, because um, they have such great insights. They know us well. You know, mm. Shanna, my daughter-in-law, is uh, just a sweetheart, uh, very talented, um, you know, 32-year-old woman, a master's degree, very bright and following the Lord. And so each each December, I share uh, my roadmap with each of yeah. our six children individually. And she sent me a whole page back. Um, just a week ago of really thoughtful ideas. And, um, and I thanked her, you know, and she started out by saying, no, you know, dad, these comments come with a deep sense of love and respect, but I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just really good insight. And yeah. I won't miss that. Right. And I'm going to need that as I get older. I don't want to become a grumpy old man. Mm -hmm. I want to be, I don't want to become stuck in my ways. I want to mm -hmm. become softer, gentler. And um, so, this is important. Getting what you've been told as your purpose from the Lord as best as you know it yep. into a message that you can share in 20 minutes or 20 mm -hmm. seconds mm -hmm. in a winsome way that doesn't duck what you really fee feel is the core calling on your life and your worldview is a really empower powerful thing. And it's not only important to inspiring and, and shaping the hearts and minds of those you're called to serve, but the people you need around you to finish well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Doug, how do you want to transition to our Q&A? Well, let's let our audience know uh, we're right at the bottom of the hour. So we really appreciate everybody joining. And if you've got to run, we understand it. But I think the best part is yet to come. And that's where your questions get asked. So we're going to transition to those questions. Uh, if you need to run, that's great. You can catch the replay and hear the questions. Or if you need to run, but you got a question, if you click it in there, Jimmy will answer your questions whether you're here live or not, and you'll get a unique email that will have your answer right there. You won't even have to watch the whole program. So we're going to move to the first question, and anybody who wants to submit some more, bring it on. <laughs> so, Jimmy, our first question is, any suggestions on sharing your life purpose in such a way that people see your excitement and your passion without them thinking you've lost it? <laughs> well, you know what? Um, the, the Back to the whole deal is um, in, in every conversation, what is the context of the conversation and who is your audience, whether it's a family member or whether it is a small group or whoever, um, in the end, ask a couple of questions first before you share so that they feel connected to you before they hear. So, so many times, especially as type A people, we're tellers versus listeners. And so as a fellow teller, I've had to learn to find the context by asking questions first about their life, trying to understand where they're coming from, what they need, and then adjust my elevator speech accordingly. But in the end, authenticity is going to win the day. And if you house an excited personality, even if they don't know what to do with you, I would still say, be yourself. Uh, but do it in a way that you're... Uh, first trying to understand before you're trying to be understood. Well, I, I like that. Can, I, can I just share one funny story? We were Please. in Naples on vacation last week. Uh, we, we took, a, Laura and I were there for a couple of days 
And I have this t-shirt that actually I spoke at a mom's conference and it's a, it says world changer on it. And so I'm walking, Laura and I are walking down the street and this lady, of course, a wealthy lady from the North down in Naples. And she says, how are you changing the world? That, that was, that was her, uh, she shouted it out to me as I walked by her. I said, uh, loving Jesus, making disciples and preaching the gospel. How about you? And <laughs> she, she laughed and, she was there with her husband from Minnesota, and she loved the Lord, and uh, we began to talk about things. But they were, they were deeply uh, grateful because he had just survived COVID, and they didn't know that he was going to live, and she was so grateful to be there. And it was just one of those beautiful interactions. But I'm so glad I didn't hesitate, even though it was a bit over the top and it was a wild response. I was wearing the World Changer shirt, so, you know, that's all right. But, um, but I said, here's a wealthy family from Minnesota, very well-to-do, who I didn't need to not be myself. And it opened up a beautiful window to pray with them and care for them in a, in a moment of their, their need. But um, yeah, be yourself ultimately, but know your context. There you go. Jimmy, the other thing we really didn't touch on too much was uh, the other, the second most important poll question, which was confusion. And I think the context is a little bit like maybe Lloyd's scenario, where he was a successful real estate person and pulled back to to focus in on ministry. How do you how do you address that when people just this guy's lost his mind? Yeah, well, I mean, people have thought I've lost my mind most of my life, so that's a very normal experience. Uh, <laughs> But again, p- what people can't take from you is your own story. The, uh, they may not like your story. They may not agree with your story. Of course, I adapt my story accordingly to whatever the, whatever the context is. But here's what I know about every person that I interface with. Uh, I often say there's three questions that everybody's asking that they don't know. And that is, who is God? Who am I? And what is my purpose? And I've added a fourth, especially for this next generation, who am I going to do it with? So who's God? Who am I? What's my purpose? And who am I going to do it with? Is the question that everyone is asking. So when, when somebody's confused by my message or whatever, if I'm trying to communicate with them, remember, just go back to, um, if I identify who I found God to be, if I found out who I am, if I found out my purpose and I uh, kind of communicate that in a, w- a way of, of who I'm doing it with, then I am relating to them, even if they're a little confused. And I might just say, hey, I just shared with you what I'm all about. That seems a little confusing. What part of that's confusing? Or um, having enough security personally to know that um, if what I've shared is not landing, it's okay to say, hey, obviously, you're looking at me like I'm not landing. What is it about my story that's not landing? Or what about that that's weird to you? Or how could I help you? A- again, back to authenticity, owning what you believe, but always being in, in it for the other person. And I find that God makes up for a lot of imperfection in our communication if we're Ill- really in it for them. Even and and actually, I, I, here. Oh, let me tell you one other story. Sorry, I'm rambling here, but I was on an airplane and there was this VP for IBM sitting next to me. I'd gotten bumped up next to him, and he was a Mormon, and I'm familiar with Mormonism a little bit. And but um, he started actually telling me. I asked him about you know his journey, and he talked about going to Africa as a young man. I was on his mission and so on and so forth. And I said, well, hey, why don't you just share with me? what does it mean to be a Mormon? What does it mean to be saved? Just give me the whole speech. I mean, just give me the, lead me to Mormonism. Come on. So he spent an hour and a half, you know, and um, uh, as he did, uh, I didn't need to contend with him. But at the end, he said, so where are you coming from? So by listening to his story, I got my story in just fine, but I didn't go for the debate first. I went for the relationship first. Well, Lloyd, that is, we've only got one question today, so I didn't know if you had a closing comment or further question you wanted to drill down into. Yeah, you know, I think there are two parts to our purpose in in life. One is, you know, the intellectual or the head part, and the other is the heart part. What difference is it making? How is it changing people's lives? And, and that is often 
best communicated with stories. And so uh, I think one of the most winsome way to communicate your purpose in almost any setting is to be able to have a cadre of stories that you can draw on. Mm -hmm. And shaping a story, a good story, takes work. It takes writing it out. You know, I start by asking myself, if, a, if someone's story that I'm helping or serving, um, it really grabs my heart. I ask myself, what's the essence of this story? If I can put it down in a sentence or a few words, then, then I can catalog it. And this is a story that represents, you know, how you can use your business platform to make people's lives better. That's a pretty powerful story. Because people think in our culture that capitalism sometimes is just very brutal and uh, compassionate capitalism is all over. It's all around us. It's, it, you know, I, I've coached thousands of people in this last 25 years and most of them are compassionate capitalists. And so, um, you know, the hard work of, of capturing the stories that are coming out of the back end of your service to, to parallel the, the intellectual piece, the, the mental piece of who you are and, um, and then be bold and keep working and iterating it so that you get better words. And, um, you know, I love speaking at YPO events, which is a, an organization where, you know, faith is largely left out and they're careful to make sure that they know I'm coming from a Christian perspective, but they want me to share the message with that part left out. And, I, I honor that commitment, but I just say to them, you know, if, where I'm coming from with a Christian perspective, what matters is what's going to really matter in the long term. So I'm really focused on being a long term investor from hundreds of years out from the perspective of eternity. What will I look back on that really was a value? Because value is always rooted in time. So uh, that's a way of being clear, pure in my honest communication of who I am and what I do and still honoring my commitment to the young president's organization to, uh, to, to not, you know, be pushing my faith as a part of my message. So mm -hmm. Jimmy, thank you so much for joining sure. us and sharing your story. And uh, for those of you who are interested in what's happening around the world, I encourage you to really go online and look at Antioch movement and see what they're, what they're working on. It's really fascinating. Jimmy, any last words of wisdom before we wrap up here? I think you're doing it, man. Love Jesus, and you'll be, and everything will be okay. <laughs> I, I loved what you said about interdependence. That makes yes. for a great story. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I will say one one last story on that. My other son-in-law, um, because I am, you know. Um, always sharing vision, always trying to pull them into message and purpose and all this. And um, he said, uh, I asked him all for feedback one day and he said, Hey, never mistake my silence from my agreement. He said, I just, uh, and, and I uh, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have said that unless I said, Hey, I was selling such a great message and they all were just having to go kind of go along with it that I thought everybody was in it. And so once he said that, I said, okay, so let's start with you guys telling me what you think and just back to that whole process again. If you understand your audience, you understand who you're trying to share with and you're in it for them, you'll come up with the right message and the right stories that work over time. Well, speaking so, of our audience, uh, Jim Stolberg says, thanks for sharing your wisdom, Jimmy. Love you, brother. And Tom England says, sounds like seek first to understand and then be understood. You know, thank you, Doug, for, for your friendship and partnership. You're so good at pulling this all together. And you, you know what strikes me as we wrap this conversation is to, to, to test it out with the people right around you and ask them for feedback. Just as, yeah. you, if you, as you shape your message, um, try it in different ways and say, you know, how does that come across to you? How would you improve that so that it was more winsome for you and more clear to you? And just keep at it. Um, keep shaping it because it's a powerful tool and it'll be uh, used by God to change the world. Well, thanks, Doug. Thank you, Jimmy. Absolutely. Priscilla says, uh, love this. Jimmy says, miss you guys. And uh, really, Jimmy, thank you so much for taking time. And Lloyd, we just always appreciate your 
wisdom and sharing and making these moments possible. So for everybody, I hope you have a great evening. Uh, We'll see you at our next event next month. Bye-bye. Thank you, Doug. Bye-bye.